appreciate the invitation. Thank you. So we'll get started. Uh, <clears throat> Shawnee, you ready? Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Namaste and good morning. My name is Nikun Trivedi. I'm the president of Coalition of Hindus of North America, or KONA, a grassroots advocacy organization dedicated to improving the understanding of Hinduism and working on matters impacting the Hindu community. You can visit our website at www.kona.org for more information or follow us on social media via our handle at Kona Official. I want to first thank Honorable Congressman Drew Ferguson, who serves the third district of Georgia for supporting this historic briefing and this important issue facing the Hindu American community. I also welcome all the congressional staffers as well as staffers of state and local legislators, along with the community members from all over the United States and beyond. Today's briefing will highlight instances of systemic bias against the Hindu American community and point to a pattern of gatekeeping and exclusion that has been developing over the past several years. This includes biases in federally funded school curricula, biases against Hindu students, and the prevailing prejudice against Hinduism in university departments and the department-sponsored events, to name a few. In 2019, Rutgers University denied access to facilities to Hindu students in violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and failed to act following a complaint filed by the students. In 2013, University of Pennsylvania faculty members bullied Hindu students into dropping a Hindu speaker who was scheduled to address the students during a prestigious Wharton India event. In 2018, the University of California Davis held a conference titled, and I quote, Dissimulation, Deception, Illusion, and Subterfuge in South Asian Religions, unquote, where the entire focus was on Hinduism and the invitation for speaking proposals asked for approaches that focus on, I quote, dishonesty, trickery, or concealment by or means of religious texts, practices, institutions, and individuals, unquote. Hindu student groups have faced the ire of entire departments and scholars in privileged positions who have called for labeling of these groups as, I quote, Hindutva extremists based on intentionally falsified information. These incidents have caused a significant amount of trauma among students, parents, and the broader Hindu community across the country, including in Georgia. Recently, over 135 American organizations, temples, and spiritual groups, including 17 from Georgia, sent a joint letter to 40 plus universities whose departments are involved in sponsoring an event that included speakers who have glorified designated, uh, groups designated as terrorists by the US State Department, and who have openly called for dismantling of Hinduism and Hindus as people. In addition, the states of New York, Maryland, and New Jersey attempted to pass legislation that would wrongly teach the swastika as a symbol of hate in public schools or criminalize its display without regard to the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Native American, and other religions and cultures for whom the swastika is a sacred and auspicious symbol. There is also a federal bill, HR 103, which deems swastika as the symbol of hatred without any regards to the impact of the language on the above mentioned religious communities. To further comment, to further comment, or comment on the surrounding instances of systemic bias, I welcome our three esteemed speakers today. First is Dr. Indu Vishwanathan. She's the co-director of the Understanding Hindu Phobia Initiative. She received her doctorate in teacher education from Teachers College, Columbia University. Her research focuses on the, second, on the intersection of immigration and public education. Next, we will have Dr. Lavanya Vemshani. She's an award-winning scholar and distinguished professor of history, specializing in Indian history and religions in the Department of Social Sciences at Shawnee University in Portsmouth, Ohio. She holds two doctorates in the subject of religious studies, McMaster University, and history from the University of Hyderabad. She researches and publishes on subjects of ancient history and religions, as well as current history of India. She also serves as the president of the Ohio Academy of History from 2018 to 2020. Arvind Kumar, and next we'll have Mr. Arvind Kumar, who is the president of the California Parents for Equalization of Educational Materials, or CAPIM. Mr. Kumar led the nationwide effort against federally funded anti-Hindu curricula and has worked with high profile attorneys, including Carter Phillips of Sidley Austin to bring the issue to the Supreme Court. Dr. Indu Vishwanathan, please go ahead. Namaste and thank you for taking the time to hear us. My name is Indu Vishwanathan and I'm an educational scholar and teacher educator. As a former public school teacher, I now study how immigrant families navigate our public schools. I am the child of immigrants and a product of New York State schools, and I attended a land-grant university. I'm also a Hindu American mother. Both of my sons are well aware of the systemic biases that project Hinduism as fundamentally oppressive and inherently violent and backwards. How can we establish that Hindu phobic bias is systemic? 
will we examine our major institutions that determine and reflect the ways we collectively think about people and phenomena, education, media, and government. Anti-Hindu bias manifests both through direct speech and through the silencing of Hindu speech across these spaces. It is especially aggressive in colleges where Hindu phobic rhetoric strives to keep Hindu American students from being included as equal members of American society. This Friday, Hindus celebrate Ganesha Chaturthi, one of our most important festivals. It also marks the start of a three-day academic conference that amplifies the voices of several openly Hindu phobic agents, denies Hindu phobia, erases Hindu persecution, and labels anyone who disagrees with them as a political extremist. One of their stated goals is to create public educational curricula that extend and normalize those assumptions. Scholars associated with the conference repeat these same ideas across news media, while dissenting Hindu American voices are denied access to those same spaces. The organizers proudly assert the sponsorship of over 50 prominent American colleges and universities. Hindu Americans reached out to these institutions, sharing our concerns that they were sponsoring the silencing of Hindu American voices. Some schools replied that their names had been used without their consent. Others doubled down. The conference then shared that over 900 academics had signed a letter in support of their endeavor. The letter states in no uncertain terms that all Hindu American disagreement with their agenda is political extremism and intimidation. That 900 academics at institutions that Hindu American children attend signed this letter, actively signing on to the erasure of Hindu phobia, including denying the documented ethno-religious cleansing and genocide of Hindus in contemporary times is deeply alarming. The signatures were clustered around particular universities, some of which are land grant and or public institutions and all of whom receive federal funding through research or writing grants or other subsidies. This indicates that a consensus is being reached on certain campuses that Hindu American voices should not be trusted or even heard and that it is vital and quote anti-fascist to erase Hindu persecution. Paired with the existing data we have on Hindu American student experiences on these specific campuses, it appears that there is a growing normalization of institutional Hindu phobia that silences Hindu Americans in alarming ways. Hindu American students are actively denied access to express their views and experiences in college newspapers under false pretenses. Hindu American students are publicly shamed about celebrating our festivals, harassed by student-run organizations that are vigorously supported by these professors. Hindu American students are warned by professors that joining cultural Hindu campus organizations is tantamount to participating in political extremism. One institution hosted a speaker who called for the destruction of Hinduism entirely. The silencing extends to genocide denial. A few months ago, one institution on this list held a three-day conference on the 1971 Bangladeshi war, when two to three million Bangladeshi Hindus were targeted and killed by the Pakistani army for being Hindu. In November 1971, in a report that was a part of the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, Senator Ted Kennedy wrote, hardest hit have been members of the Hindu community who have been robbed of their lands and shops, systemically slaughtered, and in some places painted with yellow patches marked H. A colleague and I attended these sessions. We realized that the genocide was not being recognized at all. So we respectfully asked the panelists about it using the Q&A function. Our questions were actively ignored while other questions were answered. We were effectively silenced. The silencing about Hindu persecution and shaming for being Hindu is not limited to universities. These are direct quotes from Hindu American students who attend public high school. When people in school were really insulting to you, insulting you and your religion and your beliefs, did you ever feel like you wanted to give up the religion so you could fit in? The Western media likes to show a lot of Hindu extremism or terrorists or fundamentalists, but the problem is that they're only showing us as these terrorists. What can kids do to combat that and kind of be like, hey, we're not some weird cultish group that's killing everyone. We're just humans like you. Oftentimes, Hindu girls are told that in order to be a good feminist, you can't be a Hindu. As a mother, as an educator, as an American, I find it unacceptable that the children and young adults of any community face bias and intimidation within our federally funded institutions. And because of the specific efforts of powerful academics who receive federal funding and are effectively rewarded for actively silencing our free speech under the pretext of safeguarding their liberties. Simultaneously, they use their positions of power within these public institutions to declare repeatedly that they are the experts about our religion. 
It is an overt attack on our First Amendment rights. This goes against the very principles that even my fifth grade students knew were at the foundation of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vishnathan. Next, we have Dr. Lavana Vimsani. Please go ahead. Just give me one. Ah, thank you. Uh, I am Lavanya Vemsani, historian in the Department of Social Sciences at Shani State University. Thank you, Congressman Ferguson, for joining us and everyone who joined uh, today. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I will be focusing on mis in misinterpretation of Hindu texts <coughs> and the process of othering taking place on college campuses. Hindu history and culture are wrought with generalizations and simplifications in addition to misnomers and misinformation. However, its presentation outside of India had been problematic since out of context generalizations and public activism targeting the micro minority has led to unforeseen consequences leading to vilification and persecution of these minorities outside of India. For example, how many in the general public know the infamous Nazi symbol has nothing to do with Hindu symbol swastika, or that the Nazi symbol had never been called swastika. Sacred texts of Hinduism, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, are reinterpreted with racial overtones. What is happening now is othering of Hindus using such misinterpreted tales of festivals, gods, and goddesses. Symbolic representation of evil, our demons are identified with groups of modern society, even though no such connections are seen in original texts or practice. For example, the festival of Holi is reinterpreted this way on the college campuses in the recent past. Anyone opposing these misinterpretations or out of context generalizations is name called or termed Hindutva. The issue is not with academic research, but how it is weaponized out of context to discount practitioners. Vilifying Hindu practices, festivals, and lifestyles, sometimes with false equivalencies, has become common across all spheres of academia. This trend is really concerning, since this could lead to grave consequences for the practitioners due to mis misinformation put forward on numerous occasions across America. It is unfortunate that the very places of higher learning that are believed to foster knowledge and pluralism of thought are becoming venues of hate incidents against Hindus. The number of hate crimes and violence against Hindus has gradually increased in the past two decades. My fellow presenters here have prepared information about these incidents and data sets to demonstrate how hate crimes against Hindus are increasing across college campuses. Hindus being a micro minority in the United States, the effect is felt enormously. Silencing practitioners' perspectives is also a common practice. I was labeled Hindutva for simply being an academic with differing viewpoint and practicing Hindu. Frequently, practicing Hindu professors are called names, which is the experience of many of my colleagues as well. Simple academic activities are also denounced. Our call for papers shared on an academic listserv also faced a similar fate of being labeled as such. The strange thing is, universities had a number of hate incidents regarded against Hindus. It leads one to surmise that such misinformation can have disastrous consequences. The misinformation may have isolated and traumatized the Hindu students, exposing them for targeted attacks. The trend is alarming. Hate incidents on college campuses are well documented, but similar reports outside of college campuses may be meager. This might not mean absence of hate crimes against Hindus, but may indicate fear of Hindus in general for reporting such incidents. Therefore, we believe there might be underreporting also. It is important to counter such types of misinformation to integrate Hindus into the American society. Outreach and education programs highlighting Hindu life and practice should be initiated. It is also important to examine the extent of incidents and bias against Hindu students 
staff and faculty in the universities across the USA. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dr. Vimsani. Next, we will have Mr. Arvind Kumar. Go ahead, please. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present our points. My name is Arvind Kumar. I'm the president of an organization known as the California Parents for the Equalization of Educational Materials, which filed two lawsuits challenging the hostile and in California's textbooks, as well as in official curriculum policy documents. This is an issue for the Congress because the California State Board of Education has received federal funds. Additionally, our efforts to involve the Department of Justice were unsuccessful and the federal courts too have failed us. On the content of the curriculum, there are two aspects. First, the origin of Hinduism alone is described as a human construct, while the origin of all other religions are described from the believer's perspective. The origin of Judaism is described using the beliefs in the actions of Abraham. The origin of Christianity is described using the life of Jesus, the teachings and belief in the resurrection of Jesus. The origin of Islam is described as revelations received by Muhammad according to Muslim beliefs. In complete contrast, there is absolutely no description of Hindu beliefs in the divine for the origin of Hinduism. Instead, the curriculum uses a racist theory that Hinduism is a social construct created by human beings to exert control. That too, by a group of racist Aryans. It then uses the insulting term, in, insulting and disparaging label Brahmanism to describe Hinduism. The curriculum claims that Hindu beliefs were created by priests who assumed authority and expounded ideas. Hindu scriptures are described as a creation of these priests. Imagine if the Ten Commandments was described as a creation of Jewish rabbis who assumed authority and invented Judaism, and if Jewish beliefs were described as ideas expounded by such rabbis. California also has specific education codes prohibiting the negative description of any religion. When Jewish groups pointed to these laws and requested that the parable of the Good Samaritan be removed because it had been historically used to stereotype Jews, their request was granted. When Muslims requested the removal of the descriptions in which Muslims were portrayed as using force to convert others to Islam, their request too was granted. When we Hindus sought the removal of the claim that caste was part of Hinduism, not only on the grounds of it violating the same laws, but also on the grounds that it was factually incorrect, our request was met with hostility. California's officials secretly and therefore illegally contacted professors whom they knew personally and asked them to submit anti-Hindu content to counter us. The State Board of Education then made the narrative on caste even worse by adding the sentence that teachers were required to make it clear to students that caste is also a, caste is a religious belief. Emails produced during discovery revealed that one of the state's handpicked professors described their mission as using smoke and mirrors to prevent the inputs of Hindus from gaining traction. A second professor admitted that their narrative amounted to the inventedness of Hinduism. An author of the state's curriculum policy document accused Hindus of hijacking various scriptures and coming up with Hinduism. The judge in our recent case was Charles Breyer, the brother of Supreme Court Judge Stephen Breyer. In a display of blatant dishonesty and disregard for the law, he denied justice to us. Charles Breyer and the Ninth Circuit judges ignored many facts and doctored some sentences in the curriculum to suit their opinions. By applying a previous ruling in a Ninth Circuit case, which provided immunity to the state even if they used the N-word in the curriculum, Breyer and the Ninth Circuit have legitimized the use of the N-word in government policy documents that govern educational policies. Three recent Supreme Court rulings, Trinity Lutheran, Masterpiece Cake Shop, and the Espinoza case, supposedly advanced the cause of religious freedom and were all based on the principle of neutrality. Despite our lawsuit being similar to these three precedents, especially on the issue of the state not being neutral, these precedents were not applied to Hindus. When we approached the Supreme Court, our attorney was one of the most well-known attorneys in the country, Cordo Phillips of Sidley Austin. 150 Hindu temples, amounting to 15% of all temples in the US, 
signed the amicus brief in our favor. Yet the Supreme Court refused to take up our case. Congressman Ferguson and others, you have heard me and other speakers speak about the system failing Hindus. We would like to request you to initiate steps for the Ways and Means Committee to conduct a formal hearing on the biases against Hinduism in federally funded programs and in various branches of the federal government and follow it up with a formal investigation and appropriate punitive measures against those in charge of the bias programs and institutions. Thank you. I turn over the stage to Mr. Trivedi. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, uh, Congressman Ferguson, that would be the end of our comments. And I would like to open it up to any questions or commentary that you may have. Please go ahead. Yes, well, first of all, thank you for the chance to be with you today. Um, just a, uh, a few days ago, I met with a, um, a group of Indian Americans um, in Metro Atlanta, and they brought this matter to my attention. And I, to be honest with you, I was a little taken aback and, and um, I was a little naive to what you, to what you have been facing. Um, it's not something that I, that I see as part of my hometown or my community, um, which has a very rich um, Indian American culture here. Um, folks that, that I've worked with both professionally um, as, as a dentist, but also folks that I've gone to school with here, grew up with, um, this simply wasn't part of, you know, of my culture here. So to learn that this has been going on in a very systemic way throughout the country was, was eye-opening to me. And so the first thing that I would like to say is thank you for raising this awareness to me uh, because these actions are, are unacceptable. It does not matter to me of which religion you practice. As a practicing Christian, my values and my beliefs are my own. As practicing Hindus, you share your beliefs, they are your own and your, and, and your values, just as it is with, uh, with, with our friends in the Jewish community. Um, across the board, whatever, whatever religion um, that, 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 you, that you choose to participate in, you should be allowed to choose that as an American. And to, and to simply go in and systemically erase that from history or to teach it wrongly in our schools is unacceptable. Um, and again, I will say that it's not just for, um, for Hindus, but for, for Christians and Jews and again, in, in any, um, any denomination. So this is, become, this is becoming to me a very real issue, something that I have, I have made a commitment to become much more engaged on and, and educated on. Um, I, I find it remarkable that the far left right now um, is, is trying to whitewash all forms of religion, all forms of freedom, and making, and making um, folks out that, that practice a particular religion to be the enemies of the good, when in fact that could not be further from the truth. So you have my commitment to, be, to, to become um, a student of this, to learn more about it, um, to call it out for what it is as being unacceptable. unacceptable. And, and I think you bring up a very interesting um, point and Mr. Kumar, your, your presentation um, on the lawsuit was, was, very, was very intriguing. And I would like to see, you know, whether or not being in the minority right now in the House of Representatives, we can we can get a hearing on this in the Ways and Means Committee. I'm not sure if we can, but we will certainly ask because I think that's important to do. Um, and there may be other things that we can do in Congress to make sure that that we call this out for what it is. And you have my commitment to to, to work towards those goals. Wonderful. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, if you have any questions for us, we would be more than, as a follow-up to this, we will be providing you some additional information in terms of reports that you can share with your colleagues as well as your staffers that would educate them. And certainly what happens is the Hindu community generally is not very vocal as far as the trauma and things like that, because from, the, from a cultural perspective, we have been taught to go to school, you know, keep your head down, be a good citizen, uh, be a good American. Right. And that's what we've been doing for all these years. Having grown up here in the United States, that's what I was taught by my parents, that no matter what religious belief you have, respect everyone. However, over the past um, several years, we have seen a disturbing trend that, you know, some people are more equal than others. And that is not how 
America works because America stands against those values. And we really appreciate your time today and your commitment to work with the Hindu-American community to address these issues. Mr. Trevedic, if, if I could ask this question, um, because I've, there, in, in politics, um, I've, I've, learned, I've learned something very early on, and it's, it's never about what it's about. Okay, and it's something. There's always there's always a um, a side push, or there's something that doesn't uh, that that doesn't appear readily available. Why would this be gaining steam right now? Who is who who is pushing this? In in your opinion, and why is this why has this been brewing? And who are the players in here? You're on one side of this issue. Um, fundamentally, who's on the other side of this issue? Yeah, I'll, I'll share my thought, but uh, Mr. Kumar, maybe, um, you know, go ahead, please, Mr. Kumar. Yeah, some of the things we found during discovery in the emails, these professors were not Hindus, they were anti-Hindus. There was CAIR, the Council on American Islamic Relations. They had submitted some stuff saying that you must teach caste as part of Hinduism. And ironically, they said you should not teach jihad as part of Islam, but they were not the main players. Uh, the publishers were actually pushing for maintaining status quo. And they said it's a 200 million market and they don't want to make any change. Even changing one page would cost them a lot of money. And the lobbies for the publishers were also in involved in recruiting the professors the first time round. The second time, the official himself was, in both the times the officials were involved, but it, it was done secretly. So once they get the mindset that they are opposed to us, it becomes like they have a zeal, missionary zeal, to go and fight this battle against us. So where where is this ultimately rooted? Um, is is this is this rooted regionally in 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 Asia? Is it is it rooted here in America? Where 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 are the origins of this of this anti Hindu movement? I would say the American universities and Oxford University in Britain. In Britain. In the nineteen forties. In the nineteen forties, they started this. And the current generation probably believes the propaganda. At least the earlier generation did it with some other purpose, but the current generation of professors, the new generation, they probably believe this propaganda themselves. Okay. Dr. Vemsani, you have a point to make. Please go ahead. Right. Uh, American, uh, uh, American thought process for Hindu phobia or uh, hatred uh, against Hindus is rooted in uh, America, American thought process and uh, publications here. It doesn't come from outside. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Vishwanathan, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. I think it's really important to map out, like you're saying, the origins of these things. If you look historically at media in the United States, before there was even a significant Hindu presence here, if you look at 19th century media, you actually see that, there, that Hindus are used almost as a foil and Hinduism is used as a foil. Right. So it's a complicated, I guess the, the answer is that it's really, really complicated. Right. Because there are roots in, in colonialism, colonialism that the U.S. didn't necessarily participate in directly in, in India during that time. But certainly Hinduism was used in, in almost like the religious culture wars that were happening in the U.S. Right. Because it was it was perceived as a sort of more ritualistic religion. And so it was like the anti-Catholic movement used Hinduism as a foil. So the roots are hundreds of years old. And then once you started seeing the development of South Asian studies departments, people were just benefiting their careers, you know, off of the backs of, of a community that had been colonized for so many years. So it was just a, a way to, to promote careers. And now that there's more of a Hindu voice and a Hindu presence, folks are not like getting away with doing that as much, I think, because people are saying, you know, as, as, as Mr. Trivedi said earlier, you know, I grew up I grew up in the 70s and 80s here. My dad immigrated here at the tail end of the civil rights movement. My dad was born into colonization, right? So it was very much like practice quietly at home and out in public, embrace all traditions. I grew up with people of all faiths and, and really celebrated everything with them. It, that's what felt very American. But then you start to see, okay, there's more and more Hindu presence and Hindu voice here. And that is threatening, I think, to the people who have are used to the privilege of using us as a foil. And we're, and we're finally saying, hey, you know what? Like we've kind of had enough of this and we'd like to practice our faith freely, just as we believe you should ought to be able to practice your faith freely. We, we, we deserve the same freedoms. And so I think I think there's a little bit of, of resistance to that coming up.
uh, and and how that manifests and how that where that's rooted, I think we can we can map that. But but I would hesitate to point to specific places without having substantial evidence. Like I would I would want to do an actual thorough report and research on that and present that to you rather than just speaking off the cuff about it. Well, yeah. do doctor, thank you. That would be that would be helpful for me, um, being relatively new to this issue, to be able to understand you know, sort of the long history here. Um, you know, the, it, as you said, it's complicated um, yeah. and understand the, to the best of my ability, the, the complexities of this. Um, do you find that this is more, um, it, are there currently, are there more religious groups that, that are behind an anti-Hindu movement or is it more um, secular provisions within the state? Um, it, Right now, within America, where, where where do you see that? Because again, from um, as, as a practicing Christian, this is not something that we, you know, I, that I can ever recall hearing a discussion about. Um, yeah. So, and it maybe maybe here in the South, it's not something that uh, you know it's as prevalent as it is, say, California or New York. But do you see it more as you know, as as a, I hate to use this term, more of a religious battle? or more of a secular battle? Um, I would say it's really hard to draw lines between those things because oftentimes one is used as a, as a as camouflage for the other. Um, and so I would say it's like a, an, an intermingling of all of those things. It's certainly, I would say, if you look at, at where it is clustered academically, it's certainly where you find the largest um, clusters of the Hindu diaspora. So, you know, our populations are clustered on in New York, California, in certain areas. And you see that the, the public institutions in those places seem to be the, the sort of breeding grounds for this kind of stuff. So I, I think it's worthy of, of deeper investigation, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I, I would like to add a point here. I, I found something very strange while looking for, while trying to recruit experts for our lawsuits. Some of the professors would say that they would support us in private, but in public, they were taking positions against us. They were afraid of something. I, we don't know what, and that's something for the Congress to investigate. And I'm talking of very high profile professors. They would ask for confidentiality and say that, I, and it happened more than one time. It happened multiple times. And I found that to be very strange. They were afraid of just supporting us. Okay. That's Thank right. That perspective. And, and, to and your we point are talking not, not just Hindus. I'm talking of, I'm talking of white professors, mainly white professors. Correct. Now, uh, anybody, to the point that, you, go ahead, please, Professor Vamtani, go ahead. And anybody raising voice uh, is labeled, so that there is, a, uh, there is an atmosphere there. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you trace back, um, the, there is a sort of, a, I would say, I hate to use this word, but there's an actual cabal that controls the, the narrative, right? And whoever is not within that construct is labeled you know, whatever political extremist or pariah and, and really ostracized. So Dr. Vimsani, uh, Dr. Uh, there are a bunch of other professors who have faced this, including practicing Hindus who have nothing to do with India, for example, let's say they are, you know, regular people who are born and raised here. So this, this idea, but what I, what I have seen essentially is that there is this uh, sort of a social justice angle to it, where you have the oppressor and the oppressed, right? And you're looking at it as a black and white perspective that there has to be an oppressor and there has to be an oppressed, the global north and the global south. And in the case of South Asian studies, you know, that mapping is also sort of mapped onto the religious discourse or the discourse around India and Hinduism, where Hindus by default are supposed to be the oppressors and the non-Hindus or the, as they're called, so-called, you know, the, the words used as lower caste Hindus and things like that are supposed to be the oppressed. And, uh, you know, history is looked at it from a very colonial and very non, um, you know, non-factual or non-objective way and painted it. So we see this and that's the narrative that we have been seeing across, at least developed for the past five to 10 years and amplified significantly across campuses. Um, I work very closely with many Hindu students on campuses and they're seeing this uh, when they take classes or when they stand up for their, their religion or culture they're immediately put, put down as the, hey, you can't talk because you are on the oppressor, in the oppressor category, right? You, you're basically effectively silenced. And that you see with professors and academics who privately can say, hey, I empathize with you, but in public, I can't really make a statement because of the fact that I may be labeled a certain way. 
And uh, that's where I think the investigation slash inquiry needs to happen to see why this, who are the departments. If you look at the conference that we talked about earlier today, uh, there were about 40 plus university departments that sponsored this conference. And some of them actually came back and, and vehemently defended saying that uh, Hindu phobia is not, you know, is not real. It doesn't exist. It's a, it's a term made up by political extremists. And uh, the opposition to the conference is not really from, you know, from the Hindu community. It's really coming from these agents of some foreign government and things like that, which is extremely uh, dangerous because it paints all of us as political extremists. And that's the problem we face. And actual departments, you know, if in, we are not against academic freedom. We obviously respect the fact that a professor may have a different opinion, uh, which may, may, we may not even like. But the fact that departments are institutionalizing Hindu phobia and institutionalizing this bias is the most dangerous part of this whole thing. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Vishwanathan, please go ahead. Sure, if I, I, might, I might just add to that. Um, I would say not only are we not against academic freedom, that's the very thing that we're talking about. You know, this, this, this meeting has labeled itself an academic conference, but there was no call for papers. There was no open invitation for anyone to present their ideas, right? So it, it points back to this very, very elitist uh, gatekeeping that happens around these spaces. Whose voice counts? Whose voice is valid? Which voices are invalid and for what reasons? And who gets to determine which voices are heard or not heard? Uh, so actually, you know, when, when you when you look at the at the philosophical tradition that is that is Hinduism, it is an intellectual tradition. It is about debate. It is about discourse. It is about freedom of thought and pluralism. And I think I think that's that's really at the, the, the core of all of this, right? Whether you're looking at when you're when you're looking at any kind of political extremism or any kind of extremism, the point is that they're shutting out voices, right? And, and I think what we're asking for here is the most growth and the most uh, most um, viable, I guess, pathway in such a complex country. You know, you could you could call the United States an experiment in many ways. There's no other place like it in a place such as this. Once you begin silencing pluralism, once you begin silencing voices and coming up with justifications to silence dissent, that's that's a very slippery slope, right? Whichever side of the slope that you're sliding towards, it's a very slippery slope. And and pluris, pluralism is, um, I would say, endangered by these agents that seek to 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 um, justify silencing certain voices. Uh, and so I. I think that we have to we have to be okay with dissent. I mean, as a scholar, like sitting with dissent, sitting with people's ideas that go against my ideas is the place that I've grown the most, is the place that I've and so um yeah, that's 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 where I think it's it's worthwhile to take this conversation is to include more voices in this space. And I think that's what we're asking for. We're not saying you can't say what you're saying because it's it's insulting to us. We're saying hey, you can't control the entire conversation about us because it's about us. We have a right, you know, that's at the foundation of the formation of the country, right? No taxation without representation. Like you can't use our federal, our tax money to teach our children in our public institutions about our faith without our voices being heard. It's, 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 it's obvious. Like I said earlier, a fifth grade student understands it. Very well said, thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, if there are no more questions, Congressman, we really want to thank you for your time today. I respect the fact that you're a very busy person and you took the time and uh, patiently listened to our commentaries as well as ask some very important questions. Um, we will, uh, as a follow-up, we will you know, follow with you in the office with some uh, additional research that we have been collecting and Dr. Vishwanathan, Dr. Vemsani and Mr. Kumar have been creating some of this research. So we would be more than happy to share that as a follow-up. Thank you very much. I look forward to getting that information. Um, I, again, thank you for educating me on, on, on this on this issue. Um, again, I, I, I almost feel to some degree embarrassed that I was not aware of it. But I think, as you have said, um, as a as a community, y'all have for many years been very uh, been very quiet on this issue, and now you now you're you're raising the awareness. So thank you for doing that. Um, it's important, and I look forward to the future engagement. Great. Thank you so much again. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. We'll, uh, I'll send a link to Debra.